Praise God. Praise God. Good evening. It is Thursday night here in Central Oregon, USA. Beautiful day. Summer has arrived in uh, the Northwest United States. It's a beautiful time. And welcome to Thursday evening. And Bill and Beverly Hewitt with us once again as we are talking about the book of John. You know, there is so much uh, in this book. And, you know, we, let's talk about it briefly uh, a bit. There is a lot of teaching out there about Christianity and about the Bible. And one of the things that is happening in some of the teaching is we're mixing the Bible with other teaching. And there are some ministries, some churches, that are being so welcoming to all faiths that they're watering down the Bible. Now, the Bible is pretty specific about certain things. It's very specific that Jesus Christ is the only way Amen. to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, not one of the ways. I am the way to the Father. And some churches want to be so welcoming to everyone that they kind of want to water that down because they don't want to, here's the key word, they don't want to offend people. Now what did Jesus say about offenses? Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended by me. So there may be times that we have to share the truth. We're supposed to share the truth in love, but what I'm trying to say here is we need to base our theology on the Bible. Do not base your theology on a popular teacher. And there's a lot of charismatic teachers out there, and we're not going to single out any one of them tonight. But it's very important in these days, since there's so much mixture of Christianity and um, other tenets of Christianity, it's called chrislam, a mix uh, mixing of Christianity and Islam, uh, where we want to be so welcoming to everyone that we don't want to offend anyone. And the reason that the rationale that some churches use is they want everyone to be able to come into the door and hear about Jesus. But the, and they want to be very, very careful not to offend people. Now, some of the churches that have taken a strong position on, on very controversial items like the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of prophecy and the fivefold ministry have, their pastors have taken very active roles promoting that because it is uh, born out in the Word of God. It says it here in this book. And those churches that have taken a stand actively initially lost people because they were offended. But more often than not, those churches gained more than they lost because people are hungry for the truth. I, I hear it so much on the street today. People are hungry for the truth. And there's something inside of them, the Holy Spirit. The t Holy Spirit is the teacher. And the Holy Spirit will help you discern what is truth and what is not truth. So as my prayer for you, that is, as you read whatever you read, the Bible, as you read other teachings from other pastors, other charismatic leaders, other people who call themselves Christian, other people who call themselves everything under the sun, uh, and say, yeah, I'm Christian, but I, I keep an open mind. Well, that should be a, a warning sign right there. I'm Christian, Bill's Christian, Beverly's Christian, but we believe that the Word of God is the Bible. Everything in this book, I, I believe that everything in this book happened. This is not uh, an allegory. This is not a fairy tale. This is not kind of like Grimm's fairy tales where it may have happened and it's kind of kind of cool. This isn't Raiders of the Lost Ark or this isn't uh, um, this isn't a fairy tale. This no. is a living, breathing document. This stuff happened. And more importantly, this book is the key to how to live a victorious life today. So Bill and I, we were talking about that before we went on the air and I wasn't going to say anything but but either the Holy Spirit or I or both decided here at the last second to, to speak up about it uh, because it's in the news a little bit because of some of the um, 
some of the uh, actions that were taken by TBN uh, with the Jack Ben Impey show. Um, and one of the things that we want to do as a ministry here at Ephesians Vision Ministries, even though we're a small ministry, um, we believe that we need everyone needs to speak up today and say, this is what we believe the Word of God says. This is a day where we need to draw a line in the sand and say, this is, this is what is truth and this is what is not truth. If it's borne up by the Word of God, then we need to share it. Obviously, we don't want to cast stones at other ministries. We don't want to be derogatory of them. We don't want to tear anybody down. But um, teachers and pastors at the judgment seat of God will be called to a higher accounting. We are called to a higher accounting because we are put our ourselves in a position of teaching the Word of God. And the reason why we're called to a higher accounting is because you can lead so many people astray if you uh, give errant teaching or heresy or mix in your own belief and make your own theology, write a book, and then be charismatic enough that people will follow you. Um, that, in the last days, God's going to say, you were told not to add to my word, and you did. And they will have to answer for that. So, let me say this. As Christians, we need to know this book for ourselves. Because if you just rely on us to tell you what this book says, and we say that we're reading from the book, but we kind of add to it a little bit, how will you know? You will know because you know the word yourself. Don't base your relationship on Jesus Christ with, with uh, a charismatic leader or a pastor or teacher. You need to have a dialogue with Jesus Christ yourself. As you get teaching from Bill and Beverly Hewitt and others in ministries all over the world, God will talk to you through that teaching, and the Holy Spirit will take that teaching and work on it in your life. So there is a place in the body of Christ for teaching like this. It's biblically based and, and sound teaching that uses the Word of God as the straight edge. So my warning to you is that you need to know the Word of God. And it's alarming to me how many Christians in the United States especially do not read their Bible. They just rely on the pastor to preach from the pulpit on Sunday morning. So what happens if you have a church unknowing to you is, is kind of adding to it a little bit. If you don't know the Word of God for yourself, you won't know that, and you'll be led astray. So not being condemning, not judging any ministries, but you need to know the Word yourself. So, um, and I think in this day and age, it's really, really important because we've said it before, we'll say it again. We believe time is short. I am not going to put a date. I'm not going to say, okay, the, uh, Jesus is coming back um, November 12th or some such. I'm not going to say that. But what I am going to say is the book says that we're supposed to know the seasons. And we believe this season is short. And you need to know, you need to have a relationship with God yourself. So, Bill and Beverly, anything you want to add to that? I've, I've kind of belabored the point here a bit. No, no. I just was thinking while you were saying that, uh, uh, you understand when, when a minister like yourself mm -hmm. can, can say something and, and he's preaching good, the Holy Spirit comes in and you start to verify, you know, certain things. And I look it up and I'm listening to every word you're saying. I 100% agree with you, but I'm just amazed at what he's telling me. Uh, like in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about all the end times. And four times in that chapter, he says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. That mm -hmm. false people will come and false Christ and false prophets. And uh, four times in one chapter. I mean, that, that overpowers the earthquakes, the hurricanes, the twisters, the war, wars, rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom. Yeah. Oh, four times. In, He's trying to tell us something. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we don't want you to do is, as a Christian, be afraid to listen to anyone. No. no, no. What you need to do is just know the word yourself. Yes. And you need to read Matthew 24 yourself and Matthew 21 and Matthew 1 through <laughs> the whole Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a good place to start. 
the Gospel of John. If you've never picked up a Bible before, the Gospel of John is a really, really good place to start. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I agree. So, Bill and Beverly, I'm going to be quiet for a while. And okay. Some speech. Thank so you. Okay. Can share, can share from the Book of John. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Um, read the Word, man. The Word is the sword of the Spirit. The Word is your sword. The Word uh, is a straight edge. So this Word will allow you to judge what is of God and what is not of God. And you have, if you have spirits, if you have dreams, if you have whatever, uh, let's say, for example, you have a dream and you have something telling you you're supposed to divorce your wife. And you say, well, God, and there's been Christians that have said this, I believe God wants me to divorce my wife. The Word of God, when you look at the straight edge, says that Jesus hates divorce. <laughs> Amen. So when you look at this and then you compare it to that dream, is that dream from God? I don't think so. And that's just one example. And um, there's there's so many more. And there's so many different times when people come to, up to us and say, well, we believe that God wants us to do this. And they say, well, what does the Word say about that? Well, the Word doesn't like that. Well, I don't believe it's from God then. Because... God God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't add to his word. There's so many religions out there that say, oh, new, new book in the Bible, new revelation, new, uh, new, uh, new chapter. God had a new revelation. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> the word of God stands. And if Amen. God is God, he would know the future. He did. He wrote it in the word. And that's one thing I love about Christianity is it's un changing as far as the basic tenets of the doctrine we're not adding okay well let's rewrite the book because it's a new day and age and um, it's it's a new time it's a new new era of enlightenment or whatever no no that's not that's not the case uh, the Bible is still as applicable today as it was in the day of Jesus Christ may I ask you a question sure because you my pastor I want to make sure we're, we're on the same page, and I, I don't know what your answer is going to be, but uh, about 10 years ago, I have listened to a gentleman on the radio, and he had uh, 10 pastors on the radio, because you couldn't see them, because it was radio. They were talking about things that happened 10 years back in time. Mm -hmm. Now, that's 20 years. Okay. And the discussion between all the 10 pastors was that maybe we told it was in a certain denomination I'm going to mention what that was but sure. uh, the discussion was women coming into the church that were literally beat up by their husbands who wasn't a believer I'm talking about bloody eyes teeth missing and stuff like that and the teaching was you have to stick it out and not get a divorce and some of these women were actually killed Mm -hmm. and they were thinking well maybe we should reevaluate this and try to counsel people not to fight with each other you know behind closed doors I know that's a big subject maybe the book of John got pushed as high tonight uh, that's well the, the Bible tells husbands to treat their wives as Christ would treat the church amen, amen. Let me repeat that. The Bible says, husbands, treat your wife like Christ would treat the church. Would Christ beat up the church? No. Christ died for the church. Uh, it's very specific in here. On, And it also says, and this is where some people might say there's a contradiction because it says Jesus hates divorce. Yes. Okay. So since Jesus hates divorce, then no matter what happens, the wife is told to stay in an abusive relationship. Oh. I don't believe that's scriptural at all uh, if you have a, <laughs> not meaning to offend anyone but if you have a pastor telling you to stick it out because and you're you're being beaten by your husband he is being unscriptural and you have every right to escape because God loves you so much that uh, uh, two wrongs don't make a right now that's not a scripture but that's there's a lot of truth in that you can't, um, I just don't agree with that. I don't agree with that teaching at all. Um, 
there there's a mystery there's a there's a reason why God, God uses marriage to demonstrate the relationship between Christ and the church Christ died for the church husbands are told to die for their wives and um, it's no, I don't agree with that. I would say if you are in an abusive relationship, you need to get out of that relationship. And if your husband keeps beating you, then he's got more to answer for than you do. Amen. So Amen. that's my answer. Hope it makes I agree sense. I agree with you 100%. I just ho I hope I didn't put you on the spot because no. most pastors would be climbing the walls, you know. <laughs> no, it's there's 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 a lot of good uh there's a lot of good questions out there. There's a lot of very valid questions out there because at times it would seem like the book contradicts itself. And we just mentioned one reason why, or one area why, where it could be. But you look at the book in context. Yes. And you can't say, well, you can't just take one little piece of the Bible and say, this is my theology. And so many times the abusive husband will use that, will use that as a club mm -hmm to further abuse his wife by using the book of by using the Bible and saying the Bible says you are not to leave me no matter what <laughs> wow <laughs> and uh, no that's not the love there's no fruit there's one of the fruits of the spirit is love patience gentleness long suffering where is that when a spouse or a husband is beating up his wife it's not it does not exist in that relationship um, I would tell a woman in that situation she needs to leave. Thank you, David. Thank you. It can go the other way too. A woman can beat their husband up too, you know. Yeah, usually <laughs> it's usually it's the man being the abuser, but on occasion it has been the other way. Yes, it mm -hmm. has. Right. And abuse can take on more than just uh, physical. It can yes. be emotional. Yeah. And that's a big teaching right there. But we could do all night just on that. Yeah, we could. Or just emotional abuse. Okay. But maybe we should get to the book of John. I yeah. think so. <laughs> okay. Bless you. Bill and Beverly Hewitt, book of John, thank you for for coming tonight. And we, we love uh, having you watch. If you have any questions, you can email them to bill at evm1.info or dave at evm1.info, and uh, we'll answer those questions. Uh, we just love Jesus, and we just want to share him with you. Uh, this Bible can change your life, and it's more than a book of rules. The Bible says that Jesus will be revealed by his word. So when you read the Bible, you're doing more than just memorizing a book. You're, you're learning about Jesus Christ, as we will here right now. Amen. Okay. And just to uh, add, you know, I don't know how I can add to anything that Pastor Dave just said, but uh, I always say, Beverly, no matter where we have the privilege to uh, share the word of God, and this is a gigantic privilege. Yes. And that is uh, more than we can ever imagine, you know. Uh, and, and no matter where we go, I always tell people, and it's not a way to get them to read the Bible, but I always say, I want you to go home and check out everything I say. Yes. You know, that what I say can be documented by the Word of God, because the Word of God is correct. And if, if you have me or Beverly or anybody else says something that's a contradiction to the Word of God, the Word of God's always right. Always right. Always right. And uh, that's a thing that we need to uh, understand. In fact, saying all that, let's open up in, in prayer so people can see our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray tonight if we say anything wrong, that you would correct us with revelation knowledge immediately, Lord. And we pray that you will touch people's hearts to become born again. No matter where they are in this world, no matter where they are living at, Lord, no matter what language they speak, whatever the color of the skin may be, let them know that you are the one who loves us all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, last week we got finished chapter 8, but Beverly wanted to pick up some nuggets that were left behind. It wasn't in intentionally left behind but uh, she was sharing with me today and uh, I'll just share this one little part and then uh, uh, it's very important from verse um, uh, 40 uh, 48 this argument that the scribes and Pharisees were having with Jesus 
And they're saying things to Jesus that's not kind. It's not very uplifting. It's just downright hatred. And uh, I'm going to have Beverly uh, read that with a nice loud voice. And uh, we'll just do whatever you want. The Holy Spirit tells you to. Then the Jews answered and said to him, uh, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? This is uh, chapter 8, verse 48. Now 49. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. This is what I was concerned with. If you don't understand the scripture, you think death is when you physically die. This is not what God, Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you keep my word, you will never die spiritually. Dying spiritually is much worse than dying naturally. And if you die spiritually, you will never go to heaven and never see Jesus. But if you live for him, you won't taste of the death of separation from God, which is truly death. And that's all I wanted to say. Well, you want to zero in on that, that one verse only? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he does go, do, go down here to say that, uh, and we pretty well covered that last week in verse 40, 58, that he says, Most assuredly I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And that means that he had no beginning. No beginning so and no in, ending. So in the book of John, uh, it says that in the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And a lot of people that don't read the Bibles uh, very much, get confused when Jesus was born in Matthew uh, in, in a manger. Yes, yes. So they really don't understand uh, what, what the Bible is saying. I get a little closer because I don't want people to think that I, I'm not speaking loud enough. I'm very conscious of my voice because my, we, our voice is kind of low and I wonder if, uh, if we're coming across pretty uh, loudly, you know. By the way, if you're in the Bend area or the Sisters area or Redmond or Prineville, we welcome you to come down here and ask us any questions you would like to or to make statements or to m maybe uh, read something out of your commentary that would uplift people because there's people all around the world that are watching this telecast. And the very thing you say may be something that we overlook. You know what I mean? And uh, if you're not doing nothing on a Thursday night, Come on down. And let me give a real plug for on on Friday night. Um, we have a revelation class uh, being taught here by uh, Dr. Tom uh, Watson. Watson and his wife uh, George Ann. It's very, very, very good. But you need to know who you are in Christ to literally understand what they're talking about, because mm -hmm. it's very, very deep. Uh, about the end times. And I'm not saying the book of John is, is not deep. Don't misunderstand me, but you need to know who Jesus is for your eyes to open up and, and to see what's going on. So by saying all that, uh, let me uh, close up here uh, and start on chapter 9. I wanted to say something. Oh, good. <laughs> and then I've got, I've got a question when, when you got a minute. And so go ahead. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, the when they spoke to him, they said, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus didn't uh, say anything about being called a Samaritan. To them, it was a put down. But Jesus loves all men equally. He right. loved the Samaritans as much as the Jews. And to him, he, it was not a put down. Well, what was behind that was, uh, Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem, we know. Yes. But he came from Nazareth, so he, he said he was a Nazareth. Now, so in Nazareth, there was a, a camp of a, a outpost for the Roman soldiers. Yes. That's why uh, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? They had a bad reputation. So there was that story out there that Jesus' mother was raped. Yes, there was that story. So therefore, Jesus might have been just a, a half-breed, you know. That's what they're <laughs> accusing him. But he never addressed that insult. Yes, never did. Because he loves all people. All people. You know, I'm sorry. You ever had something? Oh, no, I, I had to, um, 
it's kind of a teaching. We, we just sometimes when we're teaching Chris, Christian things, most of the people that are probably watching this are Christians, but if some that are tuning in are not, when we use the phrase die spiritually, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. What does it mean to be die spiritually? There are some people that, that they think death is just the end. So when we die spiritually, uh, I'll let you explain what, what we're talking about. We don't just end. We go one place or the other. Okay. Um, this may be a situation that you may have to come up here, but uh, I heard the other day, you know, as, well, as Christians, we all grow every day. Yes. And we hear stuff that you say, oh, I can use that. I can use that, you know. And w the reason we want to use it is to help somebody else. And I heard this minister say the other day on TV, and uh, and I'll be honest enough to, to say, gee, that was interesting. I gotta check that out. And that was when God told Adam, if you eat this fruit, the day you eat this fruit, you will die. And people could say, well, he didn't die that day. But a thousand years is like one day to the Lord. And this gentleman pointed out that Adam lived to be 930 years. So he died within that one day period that God said you will die. Do you have any words for that? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. And let me, let me give my take on it. OK. Um, at that point, before Adam took the apple and ate of the apple, I believe that he was going to live forever. He was in the garden. Uh, there was no death. Uh, sin had not entered the garden. Sin, uh, the world was still a perfect place, and that um, the world did not know death up until the point sin entered the world. So, at the point where Adam and Eve ate of the apple, then death entered the picture. And in my view, it wasn't the death happened that day, but death became an option. Death became something that was introduced into the garden or Amen. introduced into the planet, and. Uh, how, how, how many generations, what was, when did the first murder occur in the very next generation? Yeah, Cain killed Abel. Right. In the very first two brothers, there was a murder. So having sin in, into the picture was devastating. And, um, but what I was getting at as far as uh, spiritual death, Spiritual death um, is eternal separation from God. Oh, and when you die physically, you're going to go either A or B. You're either going to go to heaven or hell. If you know Jesus Christ, you'll go to heaven. Spiritual death is going to hell, and that's being eternally separated from God. And once you go to hell, it's not a situation of, well, oh, 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 oh boy, I really messed up. Mulligan, I want to, I, I, I don't like it down here in hell. It's too hot, and there's other really bad things happening here. Uh, the, People that are in hell aren't saying that. They're screaming and yelling in anguish and pain, and they want out. They want to do it again, um, but they can't because once you cross that divide, there's no going back. It's pointed into a man wants to die, and once you die, you're either going to go to heaven or to hell. It's interesting mm -hmm. when, when um, in the Bible it talks about a man who died, and he, he was talking to, I believe, Jesus, and he said, please... Um, let me go back and tell my brother. Yeah, that was yes. it. Lazarus and the beggar. And, and Jesus said, they won't believe you. Even if a man comes back to life, they will not believe him. Right. And interesting that Jesus would say that because Jesus came back, came to, back life. to life. Yes. And there are some people that still don't believe him. Amen. Amen. That's true. Oh, listen, I'm not uh, trying to play on words. Sure. Uh, I just like to, I don't know if I said this to you because I sometimes I like the blank look the parents would give. <laughs> Actually, the, the scriptures, uh, and I'm not picking, picking on your words, but the, pic, the scriptures don't mention it was an apple. In fact, it, even if it was an apple, it wasn't the apple on the tree, it was a pear on the ground that brought sin in the world. <laughs> it was fruit, uh, fruit from the tree of life. Yeah, but it was the pear on the ground. It brought sin. That brought sin. Really? Who was the pair? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. <laughs> oh. You so, got me on that one. So when God came to Adam and said, Adam, 
you know, who told you you were naked? He said, it was that woman you gave me. <laughs> she beguiled me. And then when he went to the woman, the woman said it was a servant, you know, who told me that the eat of the tr tree of life. And then when he went to the, to the serpent, he had no legs to stand on. <laughs> but I'm bump. <laughs> You've been crying all this time. <laughs> I'll start reading chapter 9, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, It is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him whom formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight, till they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. By what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So they called again the man who was by and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins. Are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. Praise God. Normally, I would have my wife just read a certain uh, segment of a, of a chapter, but this whole chapter is a continuation of one argument, you know. And uh, so, rather than going through and writing down about 57 different questions that I, I would give answers to. 
uh, this chapter answers its own questions. Mm -hmm. And the blind man does a wonderful job oh, of oh, preaching. Yes. Now, he does a wonderful job of preaching. And uh, it says here, now Jesus passed by uh, and saw a man who was born blind. This is in ch chapter 1, verse 1. And the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the reason I ask a question like this is because it was taught in that culture among certain rabbis that if you're born blind or crippled or whatever, you know, it's a result of uh, of a sin that that person did in a previous life. Now, there was no previous life. No. Or it was something your parents did yes. that caused you to be born uh, in sin. And uh, Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. And uh, it was um, pointed out that in, in the beginning, when God made the heavens and earth, we, told, we just talked about Adam and Eve sinning. So there are, are sicknesses as a result of sin, but not necessarily in, in a splitting a hair here, that if you are crippled, it doesn't mean that you have sin in your life. No, all sin, all sickness is a result of sin. Amen. But all sickness is not a result of individual sin, that that person sin. It's a result of sin coming into the world. Right. Now, what happens here is um, that the disciples uh, was asking him a question. And the old King James, it says right here, uh, well, this is not the old King James, it's different. It says right here, and Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. That's what it says. And then over here, it says in the, in the New King James, and it says, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now in verse 3, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be made and should be, should be revealed in him. And in the old King James, it says practically the same thing. And in this other translation, it says, Neither this man sinned nor his parents. This is the fault of George Bush. <laughs> no, I don't say that. That's the wrong translation. That's the wrong translation. Don't we hear that all the time, though? <laughs> We're not going to blame this on, on George Bush. <laughs> anyway, chapter 3, I mean, verse 3, it says, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God shall be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night come when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So the, uh, him being the light of the world, remember in chapter 8, uh, Beverly, chapter 8, verse 12. Chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who, who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, this blind man was naturally in darkness. Yes. He couldn't see. He couldn't see anything. But let's get real, real slow and careful here. The scribes and Pharisees were in spiritual darkness because they could not see or comprehend that Jesus was the light of the world. No. So um, they're both um, in darkness. But here's the thing that took place uh, in chapter Five. I mean, I'm sorry, I keep saying chapter, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So, Jesus says to us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Heavenly Father, which is in heaven. That's in, in Matthew. Mm -hmm. So, we have a responsibility to let our light shine 
Because we came out of darkness to come into the light. Yes, when we accept Jesus, we come out of darkness into light. And that doesn't mean that uh, we're perfect. It means our no. sins have been forgiven. That's right. So in verse 4, I mean 5, I'm sorry, verse 5, when he has said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with the, with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, there are several commentaries out there that I've been looking at, um, you know, all week. And let me just get this whole thought out to you. And then he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, one commentary says that he went and, and he washed the mud out of his eyes. And then he came back, it's like us being delivered from our sins, you know, the dirt of the world. and. Then we open our eyes and we can actually see. Now that commentary, you know, for years I thought it was kind of, you know, nice. But then I start reading a, another commentary, and uh, well, I guess there's nothing wrong with mentioning the name of the person is Marilyn Hickey, and she's a very brilliant Bible study uh, uh, teacher. Teacher, you know, and she brought something out in one of her books, and uh, that in that particular culture. Many people were born blind, but they had no uh, eye sockets yes. for some reason, you know. And the reason I'm going to say this is because um, Jesus made uh, he made clay out of the dust. Yes. So in some of her writings, she's saying this was not a miracle. This was a creative miracle because mm -hmm. he took the saliva from his mouth and he made the dust and took and put it into where his eyes were supposed to be. And that was a creation of two eyeballs. Just like uh, his heavenly father in the very beginning that God made man from the dust of the earth. Yes. And uh, we proved that in our first teaching how man is basically comes from the dust of, of, of the earth and how the, the minerals and stuff are in the 14 minerals that's inside of dirt or dust. And then the 15th one, he breathed, in, breathed into nostr in the, in the, the nostrils of, of Adam, and he became a living soul. Yes. You know, so it's the breath of life. And, and, and I, I hear a little voice in my ear saying that, that don't go too deep. And I recognize the difference mm -hmm. between the devil t talking to me and, and, and the Holy Spirit talking to me. But I'm going to say, I'm going to ignore this and, and tell you that when God breathed into uh, to Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul, remember he said, let's make man in our image? Yes. Some people are going to choke on this, but God actually breathed his DNA into us. Yes. And said, let us make man in our image. Mm -hmm. So, we are wonderfully made yes, as we human are. beings. I'm not saying that we are gods, but I'm saying we've been made in the image of God. Yes, we have. And uh, so, here we have the blind man going and washing this uh, mud out of his eyes. And it says right here in verse 7 that he went and washed and came back seeing. Can you imagine what it must have been like for him to see? No, I can't imagine. It had to be wonderful. And then it says, therefore, the neighbors and those who previously have seen him, that he was blind, said, is not this he who sat and begged? And the reason I'm reading this very slowly is because I got markings in my Bible. <laughs> and I got about 20 some Bibles at home in my house. <laughs> but some of my words are actually missing. I know. In, in the Bible. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm reading of, of certain scriptures that have been blocked out completely. 
not on purpose, but like this cross reference, that's a cross reference, that's a cross reference. Most in, marked up Bible in the world. <laughs> no, I hope not. In verse 9, some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Now, I wrestled with this for years, this scripture here. And probably uh, Pastor Dave uh, knows the answer to this, but, you know, <laughs> God had to explain something to me. And after I got it in my little brain, you know, what was going on here, I did this at the prison in front of uh, 39 guys. And uh, they went, oh, my God, that's it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit showed me. They were arguing, is this the guy? Well, it looks like him. Some said, well, he's like him. Now, here's the thing the Holy Spirit showed me. And... Uh, I hope I don't get off the camera, but I'll just get up here. Like, if I was blind, Beverly, and I went like this to you, and I walked over here, and I went like this, and I sat down, and I said, how you doing today, Beverly? You would see my mannerism. Yes. And how I just sat down in the chair. Mm -hmm. But if I got my eyes open, and I could see, and my mannerism was different, and I walked over here, am I still on the camera? Yeah. If I walked over here and said, how you doing, Beverly? Yeah. And I sat down, you may not recognize me. No, because you were a... I knew well, where the chair was. Acting normal. <laughs> I seen you. Yeah. There was no slowness in my, in one like this. No, oh. You know? And when I said that at, at, at the prison, when I had the honor to be up there at the prison, and it was an honor, everyone said, oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because people walk a certain way. When you're blind. When you're blind. Yes. You walk but when you can see, your mannerism is completely changed. So some of the neighbors were saying, well, he's like him. Others said, well, he could be the beggar. Yeah. You know. And, and well, let me read that over again. Uh, verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who previously have seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Mm -hmm. He wasn't quite sure. Yeah. And some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. So when you know that insight about the mannerism or, or the body language. Yes. I mean, imagine taking a different level. Suppose the guy was a paralegic. Yeah. And he was crawling around in chapter 5. And Jesus said, pick up your bed and walk. Well, then maybe people will look at him and go, you look like Joe over there, and the cripple guy. Mm -hmm. And see, they wouldn't recognize. No, not somebody that's walking around when he's not supposed supposed to be according to the way he was. So, so we get used to... Uh, the what what we can see yes and remember i was talking to you the other day and boy i just was stumbling on something and that is the reality that we have around us is not as real as the reality that's inside of us that is so true because the things we see are not as real as the things we cannot see and i'm i'm saying that the real uh, bill hewitt it's inside of me. The real Jesus Christ is inside of me. So what is happening around me, uh, I shouldn't get disturbed and freaked out because God's still in charge. Amen. No matter what happens in the world, God is still in charge. And uh, he reigns on the just and the unjust. Yes. And it's not something that's going to happen where God's going to say, oh, I didn't know that would happen. Not at all. He knew everything. You know, he knows everything. Yeah, can I add something to that? Sure. Uh, Pastor Bill Johnson in uh, another bill uh, of Bethel Church in Redding, California, has something that I, I love. I love it. It's not in the Bible, but there's a lot of truth to it. You speak of the reality you are most aware of. Oh, poor, good. And out of, in the Bible it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. True. Now, Bill, uh, Pastor Bill Johnson was saying, and this is something that we all need to be aware of, we speak of the reality we are most aware of. 
So is that reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He still heals? Or is the reality that we are more aware of, the reality of problems in the world, the economy, can't get a job, cancer you know, prevails throughout the population, the doctor says, I'm not going to live past next year. What reality are we more aware of? Are we more aware of the reality that Jesus Christ says, I am willing to heal? Or are we more aware of the reality of the doctor saying, you have six months to live? And um, I, I love that. That's kind of one of those, I grabbed that saying and I said, I love that. And I, I heard this oh, years ago and I still love it because it, it speaks volumes, uh, especially when you're talking to someone that may be struggling with, with their faith or issues and so on and so forth. We speak of the reality we are more aware of. Is it faith in God and all his promises or is it the trials and tribulations of the day? Amen. That's so good true. preaching. Are you sure that's that's plugged in right? No, that's good. <laughs> I don't want that sure. to be missing. <laughs> that's good, good, good preaching. Yeah. Isn't that good, honey? Yes. Okay, now, where are we at? Verse 9? Yes. Okay, some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. You know, he's like him. He said, I am he. So this is, this is good. I love this, this blind man because he's a good preacher. Oh, he is. You know, and he gets everybody mad. Uh -huh. well, he gets all <laughs> religious people mad, you know, because he had a what? A personal and relationship. Relationship. Encounter. And that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You cannot argue with a man or a woman who's had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because he knows that he knows that he knows that he knows that he's been saved, that he's born again. Verse 10, therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Good question. He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. It's interesting, he said, a man called Jesus. He didn't even know who Jesus was. No, he was blind. Couldn't yeah. see. And, uh, you know, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, more so in the, in the 60s, because in the 50s I wasn't really concentrating a lot on the Word of God, but I, I was trying to preach it the best way I could you know, look, being a little kid. But in the 60s, it was taught in a lot of churches that you really got to know Jesus before you can become healed. Oh, in no. some churches. But all through the Bible here, a lot of these people didn't even know who Jesus was. No. A, he was a miracle worker. Yes. And, uh, well, they go out there and, and, they, and they get their uncles and aunts and everybody to come out and to see this guy and they get healed. But Jesus was more concerned as uh, concern is to the to his disciples. Who do men say I am? Yes. There's not one spot in the Bible where Jesus said, "What do you think about that guy getting his eyes open?" Or you think that miracle I did? Never. What do you think about that guy walking that never. I did? Never. It was never that. It was always who do men say I am? He even asked his disciples, "Who do you say I am?" Mm -hmm. And they said, "Well, some some people say you're one of the old prophets or." Uh, uh, you know, whether yeah. uh, John the Baptist or Elijah, or, but then he said, well, who do you say I am? And this is the same question that Jesus is asking today for, to all of us. And as far as this blind man was concerned, he said it was a man called Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? So they want to know where, where Jesus is at. Yes. You know. He said, I do not know. So he, Jesus left. Yes. So all they got is, um, they got this uh, blind man who, who's never seen a tree. Never saw a tree. Never seen uh, the sunshine. He never seen his own mother and father, no. never seen his friends, and he never even seen his own mother and father. No. The first thing he's seeing is a bunch of angry <laughs> religious people. 
yelling and screaming and pointing the finger at him. That poor man. <laughs> getting imagine? ready to <laughs> kick him out of the synagogue. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, so I said something in the, in the prison uh, that, because one of the inmates had a very, very dry, witty, very intelligent sense of humor. And uh, they were like chairs on this side, chairs on that side, chairs back on that side. And I made the comment, I said, you know, this man never in his life ever seen like a dog. Yeah. Like four legs going by and oh, what is that? He never even seen a dog before. And I made that comment and this brother <laughs> said, well, it could have been a camel. <laughs> and I knew it was a joke, <laughs> but the other guy starts screaming, how do you think it was a camel? <laughs> Well, I had four legs, and that's what he was trying to say. Yes. <laughs> but it struck me funny, so afterwards, I just said to him, uh, you know, some people don't understand your humor. <laughs> <laughs> I understand a camel's got four legs, and a dog's got four legs, <laughs> but you might cause a riot here, you know? No. So anyway, uh, that was kind of funny. We laughed about that all the way home, that it could have been a camel. <laughs> We're still laughing about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. So verse... 12, right? Yes. Is that where I'm at? Then said they to him, where is he? They want to know, who is this Jesus, you know? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Uh-oh, here we go, the Pharisees. The Pharisees and Sadducees are a bunch of C's that can't see. That's right. right? <laughs> That's Just what remember they are. that? <laughs> They're a bunch of C's that can't see that even at the age of 12, Jesus was the Messiah. Yes, he was. You know. So here we when go. He was right a baby. Here. He was the Messiah. Right. He never changed. He right. was always the he Messiah. He never changed. That's why the, the, oh, what do you call it? The wise men came. Yes. And they wanted to see the king. Yes. And after, after they left, they went a different way. Yes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, uh, but that was a geographical way. Yeah. I think when people come into the church, no matter where the church is at, they should come in and leave a different way than Just when they came in. Unless they come in with Jesus in their heart already, yes. Yeah, but receive something that's going to change or in, encourage them or st stir up the, the yes. gifts they have yes. or in stir up the things that we just have to remember because there's lots of things that I hear and... Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a guy said the other day on, on TV, and I, I watch preachers on TV, and this kind of threw, took me back because I had to think about it. And I don't know what Pastor Dave may may think about this, but he was saying to this minister, was saying, now you're out there in different parts of the world, and maybe you don't know how to say the sinner's prayer. Maybe you don't know how to say, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God. And, and I know you died on the cross and I believe that you rose from the dead and maybe you don't know all those words or don't know which prayer to pray uh, he said just say yes to Jesus. Jesus in your own language and believe you're going to be born again and you are born again just say yes and I thought to myself I never heard that I never did either have you heard that? Ever? No, but I like it, uh, and it's it's so true. Uh, we were um, in different cultures, different languages. Sometimes um, there's not a direct translation for a, a, a theme or an idea or a word from English to another language. Uh, Japanese, for example, we started the Japanese uh, streaming here, audio streaming, the word of J uh, Japanese language in the Word of God, and. Apparently, I'm not Japanese or don't speak Japanese, but apparently in Japanese there is no direct translation for Holy Spirit baptism. And there's no, nothing in the culture that you can relate to it. And so it takes somebody who knows the culture that explains to it. You can't just say, this word means this. So I love the fact what you just shared about just say yes to Jesus. Because in our language we can understand the theory but when we're talking to somebody and we directly translate a word in English to what we think their word means, it could have a totally different meaning. But yes means yes. 
and just say yes to Jesus. I totally, I've never heard that story, but I, I like the, um, I like the analogy you've drawn. And I love this story that you're teaching about uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because who was really blind? Yes. yes. And who, who was teaching who? Oh, yeah. And so much in the world today, we can, um, as new Christians, as baby Christians, you think, oh, I don't really know the Bible. I've had so many new Christians come to me and say, well, you know, I must not be a good enough Christian because I don't know the Bible as well as, you know, somebody else. That's not what Jesus wants. No. He wants you to say yes to him. And in, in this story, uh, as, as the blind man was explaining to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who knew the law, See, the thing I draw from this story is they were experts in the law. Hear this, people, if you're listening to, to my voice right now. They knew the law, but they still missed Jesus Christ. Yes. So right. it's, it's possible to, to recite your Bible backwards and forwards and so on and so forth, but you've got to open your heart to understand because in the Bible it says you must receive the Word of God how do you enter the kingdom of heaven? You must enter as a little child, yes. faith believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen, Pastor. That is good, good preaching. That goes along with chapter 1 where it says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah, amen, amen. But I love what you said about just say yes to Jesus. Yeah. And what are you saying yes to? You're saying yes to the fact that he's the Son of God. Yes, he died for my sins. Yes, I need him to take the penalty that I would have to pay because when I go to the judgment seat, if I haven't, uh, if Jesus hasn't, if I haven't accepted the blood offering of Jesus Christ for the sins of my life, then I'm guilty. But an advocate who is Jesus Christ stepped up and said, I'll pay his bill. That's right. Well, you know, uh, I, don't, I, can, I can honestly say this. Uh, I have learned some of the greatest things from supposedly baby Christians. Oh, I have too. I've had a guy in, in, in jail or prison walk up to me and say, I don't know anything about this Bible, but I believe Jesus is Lord. Yes. And I, I thought, that is so powerful to me. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. he, he jumped from Savior to Jesus Christ to he's the Lord of my life. Yeah, and who told him that? The Holy Spirit told him that. Yes. Uh, the teacher. And one thing you said mentioned earlier tonight, I was going to jump in, but I didn't have an oh, opportunity to. Oh, jump in to. all the time. Oh, well, um, when you said, uh, when uh, early in the book, was it, uh, we will make man in our image. Yes. Who is our? God, we, we think of God as a singular Father God. Yeah. But when we're talking about God in our image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity of the God. Uh, uh, Jesus said, you know, that he is eternal. Amen. And so he existed before the world began. The Son of God existed before the world began. He took human flesh uh, as he was born of a virgin, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit were existing before the world was created. Yes. That's, that's where the our image came from. There's, there's a lot of people, and there's a, a bit of controversy in that. Who was the our in our image? And some people open that up and say, well, it means there's more than one God. And, and we, I don't think, really totally understand that mystery of the Godhead. We could talk all night about the Trinity and what that means, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, but, and so I wanted to mention that because if we have new believers that are watching, I believe we do that may kind of, especially to a baby Christian, they have basic questions, and that might be one of them. Right. It, uh, it's, it's something that you can, you can kick around for a, a, a lifetime, you know. But uh, what, I, what gets into heaven is just saying, I accept Jesus Christ. I right. say yes to Jesus. But after, I, after I, I heard this, gentlemen say that on TV I, I shut the TV off and I went back to my study and uh, the Holy Spirit started talking to me and says you know 
the opposite side of the coin is the people who say no and really don't know they're saying no. They're good people. They don't go out and do all the stuff that's supposedly bad in our society. Yeah. They just say, I don't want to even bother going to church or whatever. They're saying no. They're saying, I don't need Jesus. Yes. And you don't realize it. Until it's too late. And, and I was sharing this with right. Beverly, and I said, is, it, is, it, is there a, a bigger trick the devil can use where you can say, well, I'm just as good as those people who go to church. And you know the truth is, a lot of them are. The people in the church are not perfect. No, you're not. But boy, you know, you can look at somebody and say, well, they're going to church where they do this wrong on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And the devil would come along and say, well, see, they're going to church and you're better than they are. See so, the little trick? Oh, yeah. And so the devil is saying, you're just as good. In fact, you're better than they are. So why do you need Jesus? And you were speaking earlier tonight about the little voice in one ear and the little voice in the other ear and being yeah. able to tell the difference. Yeah. So the little voice that says, why do you need Jesus? You can almost hear the serpent's tongue coming out of that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. That's definitely... Uh, and as you walk by faith, as you walk and listen, listen to these voices over your life, you get to know, uh, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice Amen. and they follow me. Uh, you know the character and the sound of the serpent's tongue and you know the, the, the love of Jesus and you can tell the difference. You can right. tell the difference. Good stuff. Well, I just love the way you're communicating here. People oh, well. still think you are the invisible man back there. <laughs> yeah, it's too difficult for me to keep jumping in front of the camera, but this this voice speaks from out of wherever, and, and they're hearing it. But uh, there's, well, praise there's, God. there's just some really, really good stuff. Uh, one of the things that I think we really need to be careful of, and this, this kind of alludes to the same thing we've been talking about, was in there's a lot of non-Christian people doing really good things. Right. Amen. An example here in Central Oregon is uh, there were some churches that were vandalized and atheists, uh, a guy by the name of Hement Mehta, uh, was quoted on a local TV station as saying, we don't believe in what the church believes, but we believe that we don't think it was good that somebody scribbled graffiti all over their church and so we're going to raise some money to help them fix the damage. So the world sees atheists as doing good things and they say well they're doing good things so they can't be all bad and I believe that's a lie that the enemy uses to try to confuse people because they say well atheists are bad people yet they're doing good things so how can they be bad people and I think that's a, a lie of the enemy because what we should say as the church is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you have to accept Him as your Savior in order to get into heaven. Amen. Uh, works won't do it. And he, he said that. He said, I am the way. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And, and okay, so let's, let's take this a step further. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. But if you say God is a just God, God can do nothing unjust. There has to be a right and a wrong. If God is God, he has to be just and he has to be right. right. Okay, so everybody agrees with that premise. God is a just God. Okay, so you have Adam and Eve. You have sin that has entered the picture. Okay, there's a transgression of the law. Adam sinned. He ate the pear on the ground. <laughs> the two people, the pear on the ground, mm -hmm. ate the fruit from the tree of life. And right. so death entered the picture and sin entered the picture. They listened to the serpent. Um, so, okay, God is a just God. He can do nothing wrong. His word is law. He is justice. There's a transgression. Okay, whenever the laws transgress, there has to be a penalty. Amen. Somebody has to pay the penalty. So, if God is a just God, so you expect him to all of a sudden say, well, that's okay. I, I'm that's all right. You didn't really mean to. You can't do that. He's no. God. He is a just God, and, and there, somebody has to pay the price. 
There was a transgression. There was murder first generation. Actually, second generation is Cain and Abel. So something, somebody, somebody has to die. Somebody has to pay the price. There cannot be a transgression of the law without a sacrifice or without a making or uh, an atonement for the sins. And there's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of how they had to go into the temple and make blood sacrifices to cover the sins of the people. And that was a prelude to show us what Jesus Christ did when he bled and died on the cross. He was the ultimate sacrifice for, for man. So God is a just God. There, there was a sin, and there has to be a payment for the sin. Amen. Somebody has to pay for it. Either I have to pay for it or Jesus has to pay for it. But you go to the judgment seat of God, and he can't look he cannot look the other way. No. If no, he's a he just is. God, he has to say, This is justice. Somebody's got to pay this price. Amen. Are you accepting the payment of my son for your sin, or are you refusing that payment? And if you say, well, I refuse that payment, then God says, then you have to pay it. Amen. Somebody has to pay it. And, the only, and, and, and God is saying, and it's, I love the fact that in, when you read some near-death experiences of people, they've had, and the people that were non-Christians, they have a vision of God coming to them as they're dying, giving them one more chance to accept Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's a number of stories. I'm thinking of a guy in New Zealand, Ian, I can't remember his last name, but um, he was attacked by a venomous uh, jellyfish. Uh, I believe I was off the coast of New Zealand. This happened about 20 years ago. And he prayed to God, you know, he prayed to God to save his life. And an hour later, after he was taken to the hospital, he walked out of the hospital, healed by God. Wow. And this was a man that nobody witnessed to him. Hmm. He was just, it was God that intervened, and he had this vision, and he asked God himself. And so God can do that sometimes. But I guess what I'm saying is, we have to be careful, because in this day and age, the enemy is going to use a lot of deceit. And we talked earlier about Matthew 24, four times in that chapter says beware of false teachers yeah yeah beware of people yeah. that will twist the law beware Amen. of people who will use the law and twist it and try to argue the fact that you don't need to believe or get you off the path the basic truth of the matter is that there was sin god is just there has to be payment somebody's got to pay we go to the judgment seat of christ of god god says Who's going to pay your bill? There was sin in your life. Are you accepting the payment that my son gave for you as a free offering? All you have to do is accept it. You accept it, and you can go to heaven. You can spend an eternity with me. Amen. If you don't accept that, you have to pay the price. That's right. And if you say that, then the price is eternal separation from God. That's well, you know, it's it, it's funny because it's not funny, but when I'm a when I like I said, when I had the privilege of being in a prison, I like to walk around and, and actually talk to the guys while I'm preaching. This is not preaching; this is teaching. But when you're preaching, I, I like to walk around, you know. And sometimes I would say to the guys, uh, "Imagine you you did a crime. You go before the judge." And the judge says, you're guilty. And you go forward for the sentence. And Jesus walks up and says uh, to the judge, Father, uh, forgive them for what they have done. I'm going to pay the price. I said, how would Amen. you feel about that? And they go, well, uh, they know in the spiritual sense, that's what he did. Yes. But they know in the physical sense, I brought it down to wh what they know as they broke the law. And then they all agree, well, Jesus did that. I said, now, let me reverse the whole thing around. Say you went out there, and you got out of prison, and you get in a car, and you're going 100 miles an hour. Police officer pulls you over, gives you a ticket. You go to the court. And the judge says, oh, it's okay. You got a ticket. Don't worry about it. Tears it up. Just go free. Would that judge be a good judge? 
And every hand went up and says, no, because there's a price to pay. They all knew, because they brought it down to elementary brains <laughs> for a country boy like me. Yeah. <laughs> but you brought it down to a level they can understand. Oh, but yeah. They've experienced. They know what it's like oh, in this yeah. life to go through before a judge and have a sentence passed. And they know that, you know, when somebody breaks the law, there's got to be a penalty. But like he's you just said, there's got to be a price to pay. Somebody's got to pay the bill. And he, he did it with his blood. Mm-hmm. Now, you said a couple things tonight that I want to ask you about. Uh -oh. You say, no, no, I, I'm sh I know what your answer is going to be. <laughs> but you said at least a couple of times tonight, it's an honor to go into prisons and share Jesus with people. Oh, yes. Explain that to people who may be watching who say, well, why are you honored? Why do you feel honored to go into a prison to talk to people? I'm going to say something that probably most Christians, uh, and I'm not saying this in a sarcastic way, but it's just the way God made me. It's an honor for me to wash their feet. I'm not justifying their sins. I'm not justifying what they did or why they are even in prison. Uh, I'm just saying it, it's an honor for me to be there and share Jesus Christ with them and see somebody now you would have to be there Pastor Dave to see I wish somebody I was. come up and they're covered with uh, tattoos now I'm not saying that's bad or good but to look you right in the eye and say I have done everything in the book but Jesus Christ I know that I know that I know that he came into my heart and I became born again. These are not wimpy men. These are men who made terrible mistakes and they <clears throat> ended up in prison and uh, they know that they have done things you know, that are wrong. So what they're saying is that Jesus Christ came into their life and they confessed Jesus Christ and became a born-again Christian and nobody can talk them out of it. No. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't mention names. I don't do that. I, I just don't do that. But I remember a young man I prayed for, not in prison, but in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a work camp. I don't know where the man is at. But I prayed for him, and he, and he fell down on his back. I never touched him. He fell down. Holy Spirit worked, worked on him while he was laying there in the dust. And he got up. This young man would come in like this and look at me, you know, for, for weeks, saying, I dare you to, to convince me about Jesus. Now, this young man, I kid you not, he had a tattoo on his forehead, which was six, six, six. And after he got up off the floor, he walked out and stood outside of the tent, which was in the woods area, which is where the inmates were at. And he just stood out there, and I walked out, and I said, are you okay? He said, I, I just, um, I just been changed so much. He didn't even know the words. He said, uh, that, that, that cat changed my life. And I'm going, uh, cat? And I went, oh, what, what do you mean? He said, you know the cat that came down uh, on the day of uh, Pepsi Cola? I said, oh, the cat. You mean the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's the dude. I said, well, it's not Pepsi Cola. It's is Pentecost. <laughs> you don't know what the words were, Dave. It was wonderful. And then he, sa and he says to me, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to get this tattoo burned off. Now, this is radical. Yeah. I That's said, well, you need to go back and, uh, and you need to tell all your friends about uh, what Jesus did in your life. And then he said, that's going to be hard to do. I said, well, why would it be hard? He said, because I am the leader of one of the biggest gangs you can imagine. If I say, go do that, they go do it. If I say, go do that, they go do it. If I say, kill this man, 
they'll go do it. He said, now I'm a born again Christian and I got to tell people to love one another. So it was easier to get the tattoo burned off his forehead than go out and actually preach the word of God to people that would think he was nuts. But I don't know where he's at, but I only pray that his uh, conversion was real. I'm and still like, trying to figure out where the cat came from. <laughs> he refers to the Holy Spirit as the cat that comes down. The cat came into his life. The cat changed his life. Oh. He didn't know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Didn't know the language. He, he just knew that there was a Father and there was a Son. It was this invisible cat. He calls. Yeah. Well, I have Pepsi Cola at Pentecost, and I was just—I'm digressing here. I'm getting his way off path here, but that—that—that's amazing. That's a great story, and and he didn't know the Bible. He no. didn't even know the right words. No, no, no idea. He didn't know why he was laying on the ground because nobody's ever ever put him on the ground. This guy's a fighter. Yeah. And how can some old man with a crew cut pray for him and he falls down? What was that all about? So that wasn't an act on his part. Oh, no. Oh, no. See, well, that, that's a good example because there's so much controversy in the body of Christ. Now, we may as well talk about it, about being slain in the spirit. Oh, wonderful. And there has been some abuses of that. There have been people that have gone to excesses. There have been people that have acted, but... I have seen it happen, and you've just described a, a, an exam, perfect example of where it actually happened. And oh, yeah. it does actually happen to people. Uh, I have been slain in the spirit myself. Um, and uh, it doesn't, you know, I'm not usually up there preaching on Sunday morning and it happens, but, but it has happened to me, and I know what it feels like. I, I hope he wasn't slain in the spirit, because Ananias and Sapphira was slain in the spirit. You fell in the spirit. Well, yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah. Slain in the spirit means killed. Yeah. But the, 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 termino <laughs> the terminology in Christendom today yeah, is know. slain in the spirit. Yes, so we know. Yeah, people that are watching may be hearing that phrase, and yeah. this is what happened to that guy. The Holy Spirit came upon him, yeah. and it actually happened in the Bible. They fell like dead men. Mm -hmm. So you're saying to me a, a different uh, venue, because when I'm sitting here just teaching, uh -huh. but when you get talking to me, you know. I need to be up there talking to you so that people can, can see me, but... Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. Well, uh, I see here waiting for you. The mic cord tonight isn't long enough for me to do that. Oh, okay. Um, but, yeah, so... Well, I, do, I want you to know, Pastor Dave, I deeply appreciate you and, and what God is doing in, your, in the ministry that you're doing and how you're opening up different ministries and... Uh, you know, these people uh, that we're talking about, uh, and I know uh, this is all in very, very important, and, you know, it doesn't make a difference if we get to face this chapter or not, but I notice people are growing so quickly. They're making giant steps. Uh -huh. And I see people, I don't know if you have or not, but I've only been a Christian for two or three years, and I'm amazed of their knowledge. And I think it's because time is getting so short that they're yeah. growing with giant steps in the, knowledge. Yeah, in, in the book of Acts, it, talk, it talks about the last days. And it says um, that the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. Amen. Your, your, even among your servants, your, your men, everyone. All flesh is all flesh. The Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. And uh, old men will dream dreams. Young men will have visions. Uh, but the Spirit of God will be poured out on everyone, even on your maidservants, even on the servants. And you're seeing that. You're seeing people. Uh, the thing that I love, I absolutely love in that story about um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees is the fact that they knew the law. They knew the, the letter of the law, but they totally missed the spirit of the law or the intent of the law. And here is the blind man that had just been healed by Jesus, and he just came by faith believing. He came as a child. He said, the only thing I know is that this man healed me. And then it, it, you just it, recited the example from the Word of God about Jesus says, I am he standing before you. And he said, I worship you. 
Oh, we haven't got that part yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, but um, but but there was there was a revelation in his life that this was this was the Son of God. Amen. Amen. And um, I'm ju jumping way ahead. But there are some people that say, well, and even in the book, of, even in the Bible, well, he's healing because he's of the devil. Yes. Oh, yeah, right. And Jesus says rather profoundly and wisely, why would the devil cast himself out? <laughs> A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln isn't the first person who said that. No. Yeah. Uh, Abraham Lincoln used that quote from the Bible yes. talking about the United States being split in the Civil War. A yes. house divided against itself cannot stand. And he was talking, uh, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of darkness if it's fighting against itself cannot stand. And we know demons do fight against themselves and there's chaos, but why would the devil cast himself out of people? He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't. No. Nope. Anyway. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. This is a wonderful, wonderful night, Pastor. Thank you. I'm enjoying it, too. It's yes. Okay. Here we are. Meanwhile, back at the book of John. <laughs> right? Yes. Verse 13, and they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. There's going to be problems right here. Now it was a Sabbath. That's, that's a special day. That's the special day. You can't open day. the eyes of the blind on that day. No. When Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, it was on the Sabbath day. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. So they asked him again. He said to them, he put clay in my eyes and I washed and I see. So the blind man is saying exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. He put clay in my eyes, and I washed, and I can see. The blind man knows he can see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Oh boy. Now, is this to say that God doesn't do good things on the Sabbath? <laughs> God does good things all the time. See, if God didn't do good things on the Sabbath, I wouldn't be alive. I'd be dead on the Sabbath because he wouldn't keep my heart ticking. He wouldn't keep the sun shining. That's right. He wouldn't keep all the fish and the trees growing. Everything would come to a screeching halt because, see, the, the Sabbath wasn't made for God to take a nap. God don't sleep. No. It was made for men to rest. And, oh, and serve God. And to serve God. Okay. To honor God. To honor God. Okay. Now, uh, verse 15. You have something else to add to that? Mm -mm. No, go ahead. Okay. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. He said to them again, he proclaimed my eyes, and I washed should I see. So he's making it very clear what happened. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Oh, I read that already. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Your Bible may say, do such, such miracles. Now they got a problem. And there was a division among them. In other words, they were divided. They didn't know what to do. No. They were arguing about, how could he do this? They said to the blind man again, what did he say? What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. Now, the blind man said in the very beginning that he was a man called Jesus. Yes. Now he's saying that he's a prophet. So this blind man is growing in revelation knowledge yes. right in front of the blind religious Leaders. And they were not growing in anything but... <laughs> now, the, bl the blind man is beginning to see, mm -hmm. not only physically in the natural, but spiritually. Yes. Now, he's saying right here, he says that uh, he's probably a prophet. Well, he is a prophet. Let me correct myself. He is a prophet. Mm -hmm. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. That's your choice, honey. That's their choice. That's their choice that he has been born, uh, he, he's been, been, been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him 
who has received his sight. Now they're calling in the parents. Yeah. Because they want to know from the parents, is this your son? And was he really, really blind? Then they asked them, it's the parents, saying, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? This is what you call passing the buck. Yes. And the parents, his own parents, passed the buck. When I'm, when I'm saying passed the buck, I mean that uh, let, let the son speak on his own behalf because they did not want to get kicked out of the synagogue. No way. And I, I had my wife read something about the, the laws of the synagogue in, in a certain book. But I want to explain to you about verse 20. And that's the second marking there, Beverly, in, I that, know. in that book. And uh, it's called Kick Out or something Put like out. that. Put Out. Now let me read verse 20 before you get to that. Because I'd like to have you read that very, very slowly. Because it is complicated. And there are people out there that may not know all the laws concerning the scribes and Pharisees and, and stuff like that. But in verse 20, his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they fear the Jews. For the Jews have already agreed that if anyone confess that he is the Christ, or he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Now, in case you don't know why it's so uh, bad to get kicked out of the synagogue, I'm going to ask my wife to read very, very slowly and very aloud. This is the rules about getting kicked out. Put out. Put out. There were three kinds of Jewish excommunication. A rebuke that lasted from 7 to 30 days. A thrusting out that lasted 30 days and could be followed by a second period of 30 days. This could only be pronounced in an assembly of 10 and it was accompanied by curses and blast of a horn. The ostracized one could not come to public prayer and was kept at a distance of four cubits from others. Finally, there was excommunication for an indefinite period of time. It was forbidden to, for others to eat, drink, or speak with the excommunicated one. This is what the blind man's parents feared. Therefore, they would not testify on his behalf. The terror of excommunication for the Jews was that they believed it not only excluded them from people, but also from God. So in this culture, it was, not, it was getting kicked out of the synagogue... Yes. Correct me if I'm right. Uh, and it, no one could talk to them. No. In the whole place. No. No. Uh, no one could even communicate with them. There had to no. be so many cupids away from somebody else. Yes. It, and it then is. they top it off. You read there, they had to blow a trumpet yes. to let everybody know someone was getting kicked out of the synagogue. Yes. Now, this must have been really difficult for the blind man who just got his eyes open. Oh, that'd be very difficult. Now, what about chapter 8, going back? This woman, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Yes. Uh, now, all the religious leaders, and I'm not picking on the Jews, but all the religious leaders, they wanted to stone her. Where could she go? Where could she go? But she picked the right thing. She met the Lord. And you know something? I'm going to get into that right here. Um, um, oh, this is so much stuff to share. What? Where am I at right here? Uh, it's 20, 24, isn't it? I think so. So again, they call the man. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and I, I, I just turned the page over. Okay. Okay. Uh, his parents said, 
these things because they fear the Jews. For the Jews have already agreed that if any one confess that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, as parents said, this is he is of age, ask him. So this is an expression called passing the buck. Yes. They were saying, well, he can speak for himself. I, I wonder how he must have felt. Because this is his own parents that he's seeing for the first time. And he's seeing face expressions of his own parents saying, well, he's of age. Ask him. He's seeing the fear. Yes. That uh, this is her own baby grown up to be a man who can now see yes. with his eyes, his own eyes. He can look at his fingers. I don't think we realize, you know, the, the joy of getting your eyes open. I, I remember, I remember years ago, I was watching uh, Pastor Benny Hinn. And I know there's people out there who think, oh, they're just actors. You know, no way. You know, Benny Hinn was walking through the audience and he was laying hands on people. And he was praying for people. And there's one guy fell on the floor. And he started to scream. And, of course, it interrupted Benny Hinn's preaching. Of course. And he says uh, to the, one of his helpers, well, what's going on here? Because, you know, we're on national TV. Yeah. And the guy's banging on the floor. You know, and, his, and his, the people pick him up. And he's just screaming and crying. And Benny Hinn says, tell me what's going on here. And the guy says, I can see, I can see my hands. And uh, talk about looking at TV and going, wow. <laughs> and and you, you know these people say, oh, well, he's an actor. Yeah, I know. You know, but tell that to the guy who got his eyes open. Yeah, try and tell that to that man. Now this man was saying, you know, they were saying like, uh, how did you get your eyes open? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So verse, what, uh, verse... Uh, uh, 24. 24. So they again called the man who was blind, who was blind, and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner, which means Jesus. He answered and said, Oh, I got to read this so slowly. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. Here's a man who's got an experience. Forgive me for the commentary. Verse 26. Then they said to him again, What did you do? What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they and they what? And they revealed him. Reviled him. Reviled him. him sorry. Yeah. Reviled him. <laughs> and mad. and said they were very angry with him. In other words, they were ticked off. <laughs> That's it. Bill. In other words, <laughs> you know, they reviled him, and said, "You are his disciples." We are Moses' disciples. We are Moses' disciples. <laughs> I'm just staring at that. Thank you for saying that to me. Can you imagine? I'm not blanking out here, but these, <laughs> these words are so powerful. Can you know, you? we are Moses' disciples. <laughs> we know that, that God has spoke to Moses. Uh, as for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. That's good. They don't even know where he's from, right? No. The man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not, does not hear sinners. If, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does what his, his will, will, he will hear him. I mean, this is a... I mean, this preaching is so good, I, I just feel like I want to stop on every word. Then, then oh, since the world began, um, it has been unheard of that anyone 
open the eyes of one who was born blind. You know, see what he's saying there? Yes. If this man was not from God, he could not do nothing. You know, uh, I know I just read this, but I keep on stopping myself. Would you read from 27 down to where I'm at right now, just to get a better flow? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not, do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They Isn't that something the way this man preached? Yes. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sin. Are you teaching us? <laughs> now they're saying the same things that the disciples said in the beginning, who sinned, his mother or, his, or this man? Yes. Or his father, mother, or this man? Yeah. It's the same thinking, mm -hmm. you know. So that went through the, the, the rabbi culture at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus killed that, that uh, what do you call that, sacred cow? <laughs> you know? He sure did. <laughs> you know, because it wasn't, uh, you know, Jesus said back there, uh, it was not this man nor his parents that he was born blind, you know. So anyway, uh, oh, there's so much. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit worried I'm going to go home and say, I forgot this, I forgot that. One of the things that the, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, was it the Pharisees? They said, we're teachers of the law. Are you teaching us? That's and right. the answer to the question is, yes, I am. That's of course, true. the man didn't say that. No. But it's amazing that the that the that the Pharisees, the teachers of the day, asked that question, and the obvious answer is yes. This man, this unlearned man, this man who had just been healed, was teaching the teachers, and in the Word of God that says that um, you must enter the kingdom of God as a little child. So this man, all he had was faith. He didn't have all the book learning and the knowledge. He just knew that this man opened his eyes. And how could, if he wasn't of God, he couldn't do it. Amen. The, the, anyway. Do you know what's something, Pastor? What's that? And that is that all through this chapter, you hear this question, how did he open your eyes? And he explains the, the procedure or the math, method. And then it's, how did he open your, your eyes again? It's always how. Uh, now how did how did he do that again with the mud and you know, but it's never who opened your eyes or why why it's always the method you pray for somebody and they fall down and they go how'd you do that <laughs> nothing to do with us I'm standing eight feet away because God told me don't ever lay hands on somebody again make sure I get all the glory so if they really? fall. I'm in charge. If they don't fall, I'm still in charge. But it's amazing. People are still asking that question. They want to know, and even people in the church, we, we want to formulize Christianity. Yeah. Okay, you, you, let's say, and we've, healed for pe we've prayed for people here that one man's leg grew. And mm -hmm. people have heard this before, this testimony, and the man grew, his legs grew two inches. How did you do that? Well, we didn't do that. No. no, no, no. How did you do that? Because they want to know the formula. They yeah. want to know the rules. Okay, if I do this and this and this and this, then God will have to move. Not necessarily, because yeah. when Jesus healed people, sometimes he spat in the mud and smeared it in their eyes. And sometimes, sometimes Jesus wasn't even there. He just spoke. Yeah. And miles away, the people were healed. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a formula. No Aren't formula. you thankful to God that you can't put God in a box, that you don't have to have a, a box of dirt back there where you spit in it <laughs> and put it in somebody's eyes, that you're not locked into that? And the reason why we don't 
God doesn't want us to be locked into that is because we'll think that in that act, that's what heals. And God is wanting us to know that it is God and his love and mercy and grace. He wants us to go deeper than just the physical act we do to, that causes the healing. Amen. He's saying there's a reason why it, you don't do it the same every day. Amen. You have to come to me. And Jesus spent a lot of time uh, in the Word of God in the New Testament. Jesus went by himself to pray. Jesus spent a lot of time by himself praying. And Jesus said, I only do what I hear the Father saying. And there's an example for us as Christians that we need to listen to the voice of God. One of the ways we hear the voice of God is by reading the Word of God. Uh, also in the Old Testament, I love the correlation between Old and New Testaments. When uh, God was feeding Israel in the desert, every day they had to go out for manna. Yes. Their manna would fall and they would have to go and scoop it up and get their baskets and so on and so forth. But they couldn't save it till the next day because yeah. it would rot. And um, you had to go out every day and get it. You had to go to God for your, for your sustenance. You had to go to God for fresh manna. You had to go to God to get every day. You had to go to God. And that is a beautiful word picture of what we need to do for spiritual truth to feed, uh, to feed ourselves on. Jesus was asked one time, you know, uh, I don't have the, the scripture right in front of me, but um, they said, you know, how do you, how do you survive? How do you eat? Aren't you hungry? And Jesus said, um, essentially that he is not living by food alone, but on every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Yes. Um, that yeah. there's Matthew 4, verse 4, and the shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And, and we should be the same way. Amen. We should we should get spiritual food to feed us, just like the manna in the desert fed the, the children of Israel. But the food that we get is important, and it needs to be the right food. And that's why you need to spend time in the Word of God. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah. You know, it's not the end of the world if I don't get done this chapter, but do you have time to, to close this out, say something? I really like the way you come over and sit down and introduce new programs and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, but I do have a couple more scriptures, and that's okay. Yeah, then go right ahead. You, you just, can, just you can talk for another... Um, you have 15 minutes in the scheduled program, but we can go over a little bit. Okay, let me try to go pretty quick. Uh, in verse uh, 33, is this the man who was... Oh, this man was from God. He could not do, the, do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sin, meaning the, the, uh, the blind man. Are you teaching us? And they cast him out. He was just getting cast out of the... Boy, can you, get your eyes open on the same day you're cast out of the synagogue. <laughs> what a bummer. What, what, a, what a heartbreaking story. <laughs> Jesus heard that he had been cast out, and when he has found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? So what does he say? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? He's asking Jesus, Who is the Son of God? Yes. But he's got his eyes open. But he wants to believe. He says, Who is he that I may believe? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. What is Jesus saying? He said, I am the Son of God. They say he never claimed to be the Son of God. Right now, there he says, I am there, the Son of God. get real mad and say, well, wait, wait a minute. What, uh, take that backwards. Jesus, uh, when he was baptized, God said, this is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. Let's take it this way, sideways. Jesus saying, I am the Son of God. So that is very, very profound. Yes. Because he's saying who he is. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may, uh, may believe in him? So Jesus tells him very clearly that who he is, and it's, it's him that's talking to him. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now, you notice he's calling him Lord. Yes. 
Beverly, didn't we talk about this just the other day when the woman was caught in the act of adultery? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said to her, uh, has anybody, uh, well, make it verse uh, chapter 8, verse um, 10. When Jesus had risen himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers? And has no man condemned you? She said, no man, Lord. There's that word, Lord. Yes. The blind man who just got his eyes open is saying, Lord, what a revelation. They both had revelation knowledge. They both had revelation knowledge of the fact of who was talking to him. And you know what? It doesn't make a difference if you're a blind man, if he put mud in your eyes or he tapped you on the head three times or just said, turn around and you, your eyes open. You really don't care what day it is. You don't care how You don't care it? if it was the Sabbath or what he did. No. I mean, no. this is just plain, plain talking. And, and Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, and those who do see may see. Who do not and see. Have, and do not see. May see. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm reading. You're getting I'm too many do's so, and don'ts I'm that. reading so fast here. <laughs> and Jesus said, For judgment I have come into, the, into this world, that those who do not see may see. And that those who see may be made blind. blind. Now, this doesn't mean you, it's going to make you blind, but there are people that choose to be blind spiritually. Well, that's what he's talking about, it's spiritual blindness, not yeah. natural blind, uh, blindness. But before we run out of time, the man not only could see physically, but now he's seeing spiritually. Mm -hmm. So he's doing better than the, these religious leaders. <laughs> Far better. And then it goes on to say that some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Oh, I would, I would, I've met blind people that could see. Mm -hmm. spiritually can you imagine I just want to say one oh. thing real quick before brother Dave comes up with this I just love to hear him talk about current events and what's going on at this at this place I just want to say one thing if you're in the Ben Redmond the sisters area the Prineville area or something like that come on down and be part of this I love questions I love to communicate with people I love to talk to people and uh, come on down here. I can learn something from hearing you talk. I love to learn from other people. I mean, anybody uh, can learn from other people, and I just... Uh -huh. I, I, uh, let me turn this back. Oh, I better bring this microphone over here. There you go. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Wonderful teaching today. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you for letting me. Thank you for helping. <laughs> <laughs> break in there. Hey, th there's there's a number of things going on here. Uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, but the the most current one that we want to talk about is coming up this Saturday in downtown Bend. Uh, power explosion 2011. You'll um, see these posters. Let me get a bigger poster. You might be able to see it a little bit better is uh, the Freedom Team, and they are a team that goes into prisons, and they proclaim the Word of God, and they do, they uh, tear up phone books with their bare hands, fold, fr have you ever tried to fold a frying pan with your bare hands? You ever tried to fold a frying pan? No way. <laughs> well, they can do it, and um, they blow up hot water bottles until they explode, and all, so it's a pretty entertaining, pretty high energy show, and they uh, share their testimony. And they have some pretty amazing testimonies. It's free of charge. It is going to be at the um, 16 yeah. Northwest Kansas Avenue. And that's right next door to the Environmental Center. It's a block south of McMinimums in downtown Bend. It's the Freedom Team. You've seen these posters around town. And uh, it's free of charge. Come on, be entertained. And uh, 
just let God speak to your heart. And if you're a Christian, just pray for this outreach. Um, and the Freedom Team, are they're going to be going with us to New Zealand in November. Uh, we're going to be down there, and we're also going to be going down to Christchurch. Now, I've been talking to some of the churches, some of the pastors in Christchurch, and they're hurting. Um, uh, the big big question they have down there is is why they they're, um, they don't know what's going to happen next this uncertainty of not knowing from one minute to the next what's going to happen because there's been 6,000 aftershocks since the big one they've had uh, in fact just a few days ago there was another person killed when a building collapsed uh, the down part of the downtown area of Christ Church has been cordoned off and the city has been kind of cut into two and there's an area that has been devastated by the quakes and an area where life is fairly normal and so the city has been kind of cut into two areas we 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 really want to go to Christchurch I would love to go there tonight if I could uh, but uh, November is when we're going to be there we're going to be in the Auckland area there is a web to go to our website ephesiansvisionministries.org we also have a website called Light the Fire NZ or Light the Fire New Zealand uh, dot info. So it's Light the Fire NZ dot info. And our itinerary will be there. And uh, we're also going to be, uh, hopefully, we'll have internet access down there and we'll be posting uh, updates on our trip. So uh, we have, there's a place you can donate to that trip too to, uh, to help us uh, make it possible to go. Um, we're working with the Salem House of Prayer in promoting this. It's their event, but we do want to mention it. It's called Rain Down. And Rain Down, it's the second annual event, uh, August 11th through the 14th at Willamette University in Salem. Salem House of Prayer is putting it on. For three years, they've been doing 24-7 House of Prayer. Uh, we've been talking to George Gutterman, who is uh, part of the Salem House of Prayer effort. And we've, we've ministered with him before he's been here in Bend, and we love what they're doing, and, and we want to promote. So um, it's going to be at Willamette University, Smith Auditorium, August 11th through the 14th. They're going to be having worship teams, speakers, all talking about prayer and how to pray and what prayer does in lives and, and sharing testimonies. And we're going to have um, an interview we did with George. It's going to be on our website. We'll try to get that up tonight. And um, you'll see a YouTube video on that as well. So it's the Rain Down event at Willamette University, Smith Auditorium, August 11th through the 14th. Uh, that's not, uh, Ephesians Vision Ministries is, is not involved in this, but we are definitely helping promote it because we love prayer. Uh, we have a 24-7 prayer here, and one of the goals of this ministry is to find out what God is doing and report it. So whenever a ministry is doing something, uh, we want to promote it because it's all about building the kingdom of God. We're not here to build a specific ministry. We are here to build a kingdom. Um, one of the things that, that I want to, a word I want to share with you before we go is uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And that's uh, talking to people that are, are weary. One of the problems they have down in Christchurch, New Zealand is in the uncertainty. They're getting weary of day after day after day having the ground shake and not knowing from one minute to the next if the ground's going to open up and swallow them. So the uncertainty is just really, really getting to them. Um, Jesus talks about rest for the weary. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are worry and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. This is the Son of God talking, saying I'm gentle and humble in heart. Wow, wow. that's Jesus Christ talking. He's the Son of God. And he's saying I'm humble. And what he's, what he's telling you is he's approachable. That come to me, all who are weary, and I will give rest to your souls. Wow. Um, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so he's not, uh, he's not here to saddle you with unnecessary rules and regulations. He's not going to thump you on the head when you do something wrong. But he is beckoning to you 
for you who are weary and tired and tired of the uncertainty in New Zealand, in, in uh, Christchurch, of the earthquakes. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will bring rest to your souls. Wow. That's a promise from God. God has to keep his word. Praise God. So, um, that's a couple things going on. There's a lot more stuff happening. Uh, some things we're really excited about. We, you know, can't explain everything we're going that's going on. We do have 24/7 prayer here at uh, Ephesians Vision Ministries, Corner Butler Market, Boyd Acres, and Bend, and we have a number of websites up. Uh, EVM1.info is one of them. You can go there and find our itinerary for the uh, or the schedule of the trip to New Zealand, and our other ministries we're involved in. Another thing that we have a website up is called Planet Changer. Uh, we have a Christian news network called the Jesus Network. Uh, they have a website too, thejesusnetwork.info. And the Planet Changer website, uh, God really put this on our heart. It's time to change the planet. The mission statement of the Jesus Network is, TJN, the Jesus Network, it's time to change the planet. And so the question we have for you is, how does that look? Jesus changed the planet with 12 people. So many times we believe that um, you have to have a mega church, you have to have 5,000 people in your congregation to make an impact on the world. If that's the case, how come Jesus Christ used only 12 people to change the course of history? 12 people. He just has a dozen people who were on fire with the power of God. And so, in, in Jesus Christ's hands, in the hands of God, a little can do a great work. And I just want somebody to hear that, that, that it's not your strength or your power. It's, it's your faith in God. So many times when Jesus would heal people, he would say, it was your faith that's made you well. They'd say, Jesus, Jesus, you healed me. And he'd say, it is your faith that has made you well. By your measure of faith, it will be done unto you. And, and that speaks a lot about, there's a couple things that just God's really been speaking to my heart about. It's prayer and faith. Those, I believe, are two keys to plugging into the power of heaven, to plugging into to the ministry that Jesus Christ would have for us to do. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and set the captives free. And that is what we are to do in this day and age. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or any any town to the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus Christ says, go to the lost. Go to the lost. Go to the people. It's, it's the will of God that all come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. All. Go to the lost sheep. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That, that one sentence right there has really spoke to me, and we try to do as much as possible here free. This, this uh, webcast on the Internet, we try to do free because Jesus Christ said, freely you have received, freely give. We do need your, your financial support, your prayerful support to pay for the lights and and all the technolo technology stuff that makes this happen. And so we, we, just, we count on your, your financial contributions. But we don't require that for you to see and hear the Word of God. And we think that is very important, and we think that's an instruction from Jesus Christ. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic, for the worker is worth his keep. And we, we as a ministry believe that's important, that that we are just trusting God for the provision 
Uh, Bill and Beverly don't take any any advertising for, or any advertising, any money. <laughs> take any advertising either, no. but uh, they don't take any money for what they do. They just it's a love offering from them to you, most importantly, and to this ministry. But more importantly, it's their heart for you to come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So that every Thursday night they come here and they share from. Uh, the book of John and other things as, as God brings things to our hearts and minds. But um, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Go to the lost. And in another place in the Bible it says um, the sick or that the, it is not the healthy that need a doctor but the sick. That's true. And God wants us to go and preach the word. God wants us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Um, freely you have received, freely give. We just want you to know that you do not have to live in fear. That there is a God that loves you. And God isn't going to test you on what you know in the Bible. God isn't going to say... Um, well, you don't know enough. And this, th this is the enemy talking to you. Well, you're not a good enough Christian because you don't read the Bible enough or you can't quote scripture like Bill can. Or oh, Beverly. I would fail on that. <laughs> but uh, God isn't here to test you no. as far as your, your um, knowledge of the Bible. You will want to learn more about God as you come to know just how much he loves you. But key here is the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew the word. That was their life. They studied the Word. They studied the Torah. They knew God's law. They knew it backwards and forwards. They still missed the Son of God. So if they had all this knowledge, how did they miss it? Because they just went by the letter of the law. They didn't get into the Spirit. And Jesus said, how can you teachers of Israel be teachers and not know God? I'm hugely paraphrasing there. But um, that's the intent. You are teachers of Israel, and yet you don't know what I'm talking about. How can you explain heavenly things if you can't even understand earthly things? How can you miss me as the Son of God and expect to lead my people to a saving knowledge of grace of Jesus Christ? So Jesus is saying that he wants to know you and be known by you. The Word of God reveals Jesus Christ to you. So my uh, encouragement to you is as you read the Word, pray. As you're reading the Word of God, say, God, if you're God, reveal yourself to me in your Word. And, and you knock, and that door will be opened. You seek and you'll find. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you shall find. So for the, for the heart of the seeker, if you're looking into the Word of God and saying, Boy, I really want to know if this God thing is real, and you open the Bible and say, God, if you're real, show me to me in your Word, and He will, because He promised He would. He said, you seek and you will find. You knock and the door shall be opened. So if you go reading the Word of God with a right heart, He will reveal Himself to you because, as we said earlier tonight, God is a just God, and He will follow His Word. He will abide by His Word, because He cannot do otherwise, because He's God. Amen. Amen. Can Amen. I ask you three quick questions real quick? Sure. There's probably hundreds and even thousands of people out there watching this right now. I hope so. How would they go about uh, contacting us and saying, I just accepted Jesus, or I am rededicating my life, or if they want to send us like even a dollar or two dollars, well, how can, would they go about doing that? They can call you, they can contact you at your web, your um, email address. Sorry, it's been a long day. Your email address is bill, B I L L, at evm1.info, just like the cup says, evm1.info, the number one, no spaces. And you can email me at Dave, D-A-V-E, at evm1.info. There's also a PayPal link 
on our website where you can donate via PayPal or you can um, just you let it send us a check send us a dollar bill um, nothing to me no the yeah. the Bill and Beverly don't take anything from this teaching they just put everything into the ministry and uh, um, so and we we thank them for that that generous contribution um, and I don't take anything from the ministry either uh, at this point I am not paid by this ministry all of the money goes into utility bills uh, ministry outreach all of its poured into outreach and the cost for the utilities so um, it's a it's a walk of faith and it's a love walk because we all feel the time is short and we want to tell you about Jesus Let, analogy is let's say okay let's say you've been invited to a dinner and let's say it's the best banquet you've ever experienced and let's say you went to a motel or a restaurant in Bend and all oh, the food was delicious it was so good and wouldn't you want to go say hey Bill I just went to this restaurant it's Bill and Beverly's restaurant and <laughs> and it's just amazing we had fish there and it was salmon and it was the best salmon I ever ate okay so you have that experience and you want to go tell everybody when you come to know Jesus and when this this yoke of of worry is lifted from you and and you have joy in your life when you sit at the banquet table of the king and you partake of his goodness partake of his his peace and his rest don't you want to share that with people if you go to a good restaurant you want to tell everybody but when you know Jesus Christ and when you come to know that this thing is changing your life amen don't you want to tell other people? Because the restaurant, you want them to have good food. You want them to, to know what it's like to eat good food, to have the same experience you did at that restaurant. So why then would you hide the word of God from them? Um, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Why would you want to hide this from them if it's a key to them having joy for eternity instead of going to hell and be eternally separated from God and the picture we have of hell is um, I don't want to preach on that and I've heard sermons about the devil and hell and how bad it is and it's bad it's really bad um, fire and eternal damnation and and um, no exit no exit no mulligans in hell no air conditioning no air conditioning <laughs> And once you once you cross over, once you sit before the judgment seat of God, and and He says, "Who's going to pay the bill?" If you say, "I am," they said, "Okay." And then you go, and 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 you're you can't go back. Eternally, you're separated. You'll spend eternity in torment, eternity in chaos, eternity. You think of the the worst possible day you had at the office or the worst possible day you had in your life. It doesn't compare with the hell and the torment you will experience in hell. It doesn't. And my prayer is that you don't ever realize that what I say is true. There will be some people listening to my voice that will remember this when they go to hell and they'll say, he was right, but it's too late for me now you have a chance to not make that decision you have a chance to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior you have a chance to be eternally together with God your life your spirit when this body stops living your spirit goes on it's gonna go one of two places heaven or hell there are a lot of people that think that the light gets turned off and you just like when you have an operation when most people have operations, it's you, your blank. Your your mind just goes blank. Um, I know it does for me when I have operations. Is that how it does for you? Oh well, no, no. that's not how it is. I can't remember, Dave. It's too long ago. <laughs> that's not how it is in heaven or hell. You're gonna go one or two places. Uh, one or two places, heaven or hell. There's your soul will continue 
but where do you want to spend Amen. eternity? Amen. Now, eternity is a very, very, very long time. It never ends. So where do you want to spend it? Do you want to spend it in eternal torment? Or do you want to spend it where there's praise and music and love and peace and joy? Where do you want to spend your eternity? And if you accept Jesus Christ, there can be a peace that surpasses all understanding. You don't have to wait till you go till you die and go to heaven to uh, experience the joy of the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is here within you, and you can start having that peace and that joy that surpasses all understanding. And when Paul was in prison, I love this scripture. And when Paul was in prison, he um, was singing praises to God. And the church was praying for, for Paul. <laughs> and I love it. Uh, and in the middle of the night, the prison doors were open. And, and everyone in that prison was free. What, what's amazing to me is that, that uh, he came knocking on the door and they didn't believe it was him, even though they were praying that he'd be released from prison. Uh, that is, is, is incredible to me and something we need to learn from that. We need to be expectant that God will answer our prayers. That God will answer our prayers. Praise God, I'm... Where is that? Well, P Peter was in prison. Oh, Peter! <laughs> and remember, he came, remember, he came to the to the see uh, Acts chapter twelve. I know that's the right chapter. Peter was in prison, stocked, you know, and then, remember he got loose and he came down and his chains fell off. And oh, Peter was in prison. Peter, that's close enough. Okay. <laughs> It's, you, it's a long day. You're up here all day long, 24 hours a day. But, Most pastors go home and sleep. Oh, but uh, Peter was in prison. It's and, okay. Uh, grace abounds. Amen. We all make mistakes. But uh, what, I, what I do want you to know is, is, boy, the peace that you experience with God. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect Amen. to be accepted in the kingdom of God. You just have to love Jesus and accept him because grace abounds Amen. in the kingdom of God. Can Blessing. I say one thing before we say sure. good night? Um, uh, you know, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, let us know. Even if you're a born-again Christian and this program is ministering to you, let us know. These would be wonderful, wonderful reports and like Dave said it's kind of difficult for him to say but <laughs> if, you, if you feel like you want to send a couple dollars it would be wonderful it would be used to support this ministry and uh, but just let us know that you're out there and you're alive and your heart is ticking <laughs> mm -hmm. and Amen. we hope to see you Saturday in uh, downtown Bend Amen, Amen. Just remember that you, um, we all make mistakes. I just made one tonight. Uh, hey, you, we make it all the time. You make them all the time. <laughs> <You d> <laughs> Potter, Peter, Paul. Peter, Paul, Where's Mary? Mary? Where's Mary? <laughs> That's a rock to you. Folk music a long time ago. But you don't have to be perfect to be a Christian, and you don't have to be perfect to be accepted by Jesus. He Amen. loves you just the way you are. Amen. Somebody needs to hear that. Amen. Someone needs to know that we can make mistakes, and God still loves us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Have a good night. God bless. God bless you.